Um, okay, so as a guest today, we're going to talk about Central Drift. I apologize. So, presented less amusingly, Continental Drift. Um, so, Alfred Wegener proposed it. People hated it. So, you know, with science, you need to have mechanisms, right? Like, okay, you say, say, you know, the world works this way. Well, why does it work that way? I don't know. So, the idea was the continents are moving around. Look, they all fit together and stuff. Was it, well, why are they moving? Okay. They had no explanation. Okay. So, it was like, oh, yeah, it's a cool pattern, but not true. But then, in the 1950s and 60s, we actually found, started finding evidence that this was actually right. And so looking at the seafloor, okay, and mid-Atlantic ridge, the Atlantic Ocean is getting wider. Okay, so if you want to swim, do it now, because it's going to get harder tomorrow, right? Um, so it keeps getting wider and wider and wider all the time. And another thing that happens with Earth is, you know, North Pole is, you know, not up, but uh, that way, right? And <coughs> what happens periodically is the magnetic field reverses. And what was north becomes south. Okay? And rocks, as they crystallize, if they have iron crystals that respond to the magnetic field, like little tiny compasses, right? So they can spin in response to the magnetic field and then get frozen as the crust solidifies. And so you have all these frozen compasses, and sometimes they'll point north, and sometimes they'll point south, and sometimes they'll point north, sometimes they'll point south. And as you move away from this mid Atlantic ridge, this conveyor belt of new rock, you see on each side, they'll point the same way in sort of parallel stripes, okay? Which suggests that, you know, they formed the same time here and then moved out, okay? So that's sort of indirect evidence of that. And now we have other evidence. I mean, we can actually measure, um, you know, using lasers that have very precise, the actual direct movement of plates. We know about things like earthquakes that are caused by continental plates, Hawaii, you know, moving across a hot spot. So there's lots of now evidence for this. You know, so we're trying to understand, you know, so it is due to like mantle flow. So we're trying to understand what causes this mantle flow. It's a little active science there. But we have, you know, the that continental drift is actually happening. It was originally a crazy theory, but now actually people believe it. Okay. <coughs> and here we see some examples of what happens as a result of continental drift. Right? So we have, you know, here we have a subducting plate. So one plate going under another. Right? And when they go, there's some friction and scraping and sort of pushes up mountains. You see that? We see hot spots like Hawaii talked about. We see a spreading ridge, so like the middle of the Atlantic, right, where the plates are coming apart. Okay? Um, we see a continental rift zone. Okay? So um, Africa has a continental rift where Africa is actually breaking apart. Okay? Um, island arcs. And this you know, this creates lots of things. It creates earthquakes and things like that, and volcanoes, which affect evolution, of course. Um, but they also cause, you know, lands to connect and dis disappear and, and, and come apart, right? So California actually is an accretion of these terrains that kept coming in from the Pacific and glomming on. And start thinking, like, what will happen if you have, you know, imagine Hawaii landing in California and they come that far or something like that. What would happen to California's environment? Right? India, you know, broke off from Gondwana and then <laughs> shot north and slammed into Asia, right? Mountains, the Himalayas still going up, right? From India slamming into it. Okay? So all the things riding India, oh, we're in Asia now. Hey. And Asia's like, oh, who are you? And, you know, interaction that way. Okay, and we'll get to this in uh, North America, South America soon. Here we see the effect of this on a particular species, right? So here we have species A, and then perhaps sea levels rise, perhaps the river appears. We split into two islands, okay? Now we don't have gene flow between A and B, well, a, the western A and the eastern A, and they diverge into separate species, okay? And why that happens we'll get to later on. But for now you can understand that with lack of gene flow, species start evolving separately and eventually can't reproduce anymore, okay? They might think that, you know, one species thinks that yellow feathers are sexy, the other species thinks that dancing is sexy. And so they come over and say, hey, look, I have yellow feathers. Like, okay. <laughs> right? And no mating. Okay? There are going to be genetic factors that prevent reproduction, things like that. Okay? Or, or behavior, like where they live and that sort of thing. <coughs> so, you know, of course, this is represented as A becoming A and B. Okay? Now, technically, what should be is 
and a down here becomes b and b prime. <coughs> Over here they're keeping it simple, making it a and b. The eastern island splits again, and now we have this tree. And why is it this tree? Why isn't it Why isn't it that one? So during this point, what's going to become B and C is evolving changes from A, right? And all those changes are on that part of the tree. Yeah, good. Okay, and then I can have another bedrock event like a mountain range appearing, and then C speciates, and then I can have dispersal. Okay, and there have been religious wars about dispersal versus eukaryotes in biogeography. So how much of what we see is based on, you know, the continents or islands splitting? How much of it is based on them being stable in animals or plants moving from place to place? Okay. And the true answer, like in this, most, most of biology, is a mixture of both. It's not all one or all the other. Okay. So unless it's really fun to fight about it, apparently. Okay. So here we see an uh, area cladogram. Okay. And so this is showing how areas are getting separated and where we have dispersal between areas. Okay. And basically, what I want you to get from this is that there are algorithms you can use and say, okay, here's where my species are. Can I figure out, did they hop from place to place or did the places themselves split? Okay? You don't need to actually know the algorithm in detail itself. So here you see a history of, con of some continental drift. Okay? So we have late Triassic. We start doing a chart, see if you can recognize, you know, where, where you are, where the continents are, that you know, as we go through, to go through, right? So early Jurassic, early Cretaceous, KT boundary, and remember what happens here, right? So I have to tell you where the Yucatan is, right? Um, and then you can see where it goes from here, right? But note, what's this thing? India, India. yeah, shooting off. And Madagascar, right there, <clears throat> right? <coughs> okay. Also note, we don't have an isthmus of Panama yet, right? So we can have things going across this, this isthmus. <coughs> Excuse me. Why did all of the landmass start on one side? That's a good one. I don't know. That was actually a convergence and then all the separate before. There's um Pangea was the second supercontinent prior to that was New Guinea and prior to that was a lot of island arms. And the beginning of that convergence of things is still in there. But it was a vertical or horizontal motion of the continent. It shows no movement at all. One thing to think about also is the effect on climate, right? So um, let's go back a slide. So we think about um, why do we have deserts in, you know, the Atacama and Chile or the Sahara Desert, right? Well, it's because we have these mountain ranges and we have moist wind coming from the water from the ocean, going up, getting cooler, dropping all the rain, going back, getting warmer, being able to hold more water, and having n not raining anymore, right? And the thing about a huge supercontinent, right? The middle is very very far from ocean inputs, so it'll be very very dry. Once you start splitting up, things get closer to the ocean. So it's effects like that, too. Um, also think about things like the Gulf Stream, right? So <clears throat> one more you will have about climate change is you'll know, have the Gulf Stream bringing warm water up to England. Because then I'll turn that off, you know, it's a very, very chilly bath for England. Right? England is very co much colder, OK? It's more like Norway. Um, and so you think you can block off. If, if there were a, a you know, flow going here, and then you have the isthmus popping up, it's blocked. Like, how does that affect temperatures? How does that affect dispersal? Okay. All right, so what are these? Lemurs. Okay. And clearly lemurs, yeah. Okay. So here is uh, showing biogeography 
of Madagascar, right? So Madagascar now is an island, right? Um, at one point, it was connected to India, and before that, it was connected to India, Antarctica, Australia, South America, so Gondwana. Okay, and so the question is, how did lemurs get there? Did they originate? And the lemurs, are, lemurs are only found in Madagascar now. Okay, so did they originate in Gondwana, and then the only remnants survive in Madagascar? Did they originate, you know, in India and then hop over and then go extinct in India? That's the question. You know? And so. What you can do for that is use the phylogeny to figure out when did this split happen between lemurs and other species. Okay? And it happened after this split, okay? which suggests that lemurs dispersed over to Madagascar. So one or a few individuals, maybe even a few species, got there. Probably one species, maybe a few individuals, maybe just a pregnant female, got there and started producing and created this diversity of lemurs. And lemurs are amazing things. There's some that look like, you know, ghouls of some sort that have these red long fingers for reaching in to get moths out of crevices. There used to be ones the size of gorillas that people, when we got to Madagascar, killed. It's a yeah, typical story of what happens when we, when we move around, right? Um, it used to be even more diversity than we see now. So here's one cool thing. So South America used to be sort of like Australia, sort of Africa would want to split. So sailing alone through the seas by itself with its land mammals, right? And then connected to a North America via this isthmus. Okay, and this is very recent, I mean 2.7 million years. And then we immediately got this great American biotic interchange. Okay. And basically now they have a land bridge connecting these two separate continents. And so things that came up from South America were things like really relatives of capybaras, um, Giant terrestrial birds, um, ground sloths, parrots, tapirs, rhinos, that sort of thing. And going south were things like camels, so alpacas, llamas nowadays, horses, um, elephants, we used to have those up here, um, and then various cameras, carats. Okay. And so there's this great interchange. Right? And What's happened since is most of the ones that came north have gone extinct. Can we name things that have survived? Originally South American that came north. Armadillo? Yep. And what's another? Horses. Nope. Yeah, so horses. So these all, all the ones down here were originally up here. Oh, OK. Yeah. So horses were in North America. <coughs> Then went south um, and died out in North America. Okay. We still have capybaras. We they have capybaras in South America. We don't have them up here. Yeah. And actually, the whole Native American horse culture that developed in North America was after horses escaped from early Spanish explorers. We ran wild for a while, and then in, in the hundreds of years later, we redomesticated and created the whole like Plains Indians, Lower Plains Native Americans horse culture, actually from a reintroduction of horses. No, we don't tapers in North America, but possum. That's another thing where the only marsupial we have in North America, right, was this relic kept on South America that got north. They don't have tapers in Central America? It's a, well, they, they, no, they have, they're in South America. I don't think they get up to Central America. Check, maybe we check that. But there's nothing on North America proper north of Central America. Questions? The one question I asked was how does this affect marine life? All right, so what's a bridge to land life is a barrier for sea life. And so if we look at, you know, zoom in here, we can see all these species that separated um, based on this, this isthmus, right? So now we have the canal going through, right? But, you know, that's new. And also goes through fresh water, which sort of eliminates things moving between the oceans, right? But there are all these pairs of species of, sh of shrimp where the closest relative of each is on the other side of the isthmus. So basically, there's one species, isthmus popped up and separated into two, two different species. Okay, okay. island biogeography. So who knows what, the, what this is? Uh, 
I never missed a question that was like that on an exam one. So you know it's important. <laughs> What do these plots mean? It's about how near the land island is and how big it is. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, so those are the important variables. So the bigger and closer the island is, the more dynamic it is. Mm -hmm. Right. The smaller and closer the land is, the more dynamic it is. Not that dynamic. Yep. You can take boring. <laughs> yeah. um, why is that? Yep, so the, the that aspect and also just the, the size alone affects you know how many individuals you can have on the island and this affects the uh, extinction rate. Right, if I only have enough room for five individuals, at some point they're all going to be male and I'm out of luck. Right, if we have room for 5,000, it's much more likely to have a sustainable population. Okay. And actually some really cool work on this was done um, by Dan Simberlow, who's a professor here. And we just took a bunch of mangrove islands, these really small islands, counted all the species on them of invertebrates, covered them with exterminator tents, killed everything inside, with, with you know, well, killed all the insects inside. And they're small scale, it's not like, you know, killing Cuba. It's like, you know, islands of this size, like the size of the room. Took the tents off and waited. And then saw how many species came back. And found that, wow, actually it did match. So the one, islands that were closer got more species. The islands that were bigger got more species. And the number of species they got back were about the same as they had before the extermination. Which species were there might be different, but the numbers were the same. Okay. And the idea here is, is this balance between extinction and immigration. Right? So you get this dynamic equilibrium, which you see a lot in nature. Right? So now, yeah. I'm not sure, but I mean, these were, I mean, small islands. Like, like there are, you know, there are many, many, many islands. They just took a few for their st study. So it's not, it wasn't like, you know, paving the rainforest or anything like that. It was, people don't care about bugs. Either. Yeah, bugs are animals, so they're okay to mess with. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. Thousands of bugs they killed. Yeah. yeah. I think they have brains. They actually have brain clusters too. Yeah. But yeah, and, and I mean, there are experiments now in the rainforest where people like cut down, you know, you know, different uh, squares of different sizes and different distributions to see how that affects species movement and things like that. So, I mean, doing destructive sampling is not unheard of, and yeah. Um, but but uh, good, good question. Um, but the main point here also is this dynamic equilibrium, right? It's not that you get fixed at exactly ten species; you stay there. If you get 10, another one comes in, then two die out, then another one comes in, and it's this fluctuating one, and which species is there change, okay? But overall, if it gets a lot, then it sort of drops back down. If it gets too few, it goes back up, okay? This is dynamic equilibrium we see a lot in biology, okay? <coughs> you know, everything from, like, how many red blood cells you have to, you know, what the, pop what the population of things in an area is to, you know, how many species you have through time. Here we see some classic biogeography of these various lines. Okay. And you, know, you have a whole bunch of islands, you know, islands here, islands here, islands here. But what you see is a great difference between the stuff on these islands versus the stuff on these islands. Stuff over here, like west of Wallace's line, is typically Asian in origin. So the closest relatives are in Asia. Over here, close relatives are in Australia. So why do we have that? Um, <coughs> And when you, here we have, again, two plates coming together. So we have a bunch of islands, but some islands came primarily from the southeast, some from the, the northwest. And also, there are these deep channels here, so that as ocean levels go up and down, some of these islands become connected. So things can walk from Sumatra to Borneo. Okay? But then when, um, but even when the ocean levels are low like that, there's still, because of these deep channels, water separating these islands from over there. So it's harder for a species to get across. Helps maintain these barriers. Okay. All right. Um, 
humans. So when did we go from place to place? Okay, and here we have some information on human fossil sites. Okay, and um, you know, and here we have information on the sites and time. Okay, and so you know, human, we you know, so we crossed, so we we spread out of Africa, moved around the planet, right? We crossed across the Bering Strait over a land bridge, presumably, and then started going down the coast and going across. And so there's ongoing work on figuring out exactly how quickly that happened. Okay, there's not some evidence that it happened really quickly, faster than people thought. Okay. Um, it does another ongoing research. And also, doing, people are doing the same thing in Southeast Asia, in Oceania, looking at how people dispersed across there. Okay. And actually, there's really amazing examples of human dispersal to remote Pacific islands. Right? You, you can't see land, you go out in your boat and somehow find land. Right? So how did that happen? Interesting. <coughs> so yeah. was that part of the world all icy and snowy back when, when they did this? So here we see in white yeah. these ice sheets. Right? So it went down about to New York and then a little further south in the west. But along the coastline, it was free. I'm not sure if it was free all the way along here or not. But um, I'm just curious why you would migrate from a tropical island, coastal area, to an, a cold place. Well, I mean, there are people here who, you know, adapted to the cold area up here. It wasn't like people, you know, left Africa 10 years later, were in Siberia. You know, people dispersed and you know, grew accustomed to the climate, grew, got, got tools adapted to the climate. And so people who are living up here are all cold, cold adapted, and their cultures are cold, cold adapted. Yeah. So are these numbers the... No, those aren't ages. Those are, those are indexes into a, a, a table. So okay. it, 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 yes. like yeah, sorry. If, if, you get, if you get this paper, you can look and look at that. Good, good question. Other questions? So that's biogeography, which is a large scale movement of species. There's also a structure within species, right? So here I have a phylogeny of, you know, a large scale phylogeny of mammals, birds, reptiles, etc. Okay? I can zoom in just on mammals, and look at just a tree of mammals, and then zoom in on one mammal tree, and look at the pedigree. All right? So, you know, you are here, and your sister's here, and your brother's here, that sort of scale. And so on things of this scale, you should look at ge geographic structuring there. Right? Why do we care? So for a little, let's go up a level. Why do we care about biogeography? You know, movement across continents and speciation as a result of, of splitting and that sort of thing. Right, but I can care about why this, why the tables are from mica instead of wood. I mean, that's a question too. And what does this do for us? Not in terms of like you know make us richer, but like you know does this explain any large? So back to our lecture last time about empirical distributions. Does this explain any large scale patterns that we see? Right. So we can get that from like phylogenetics in general. That's true. Yeah. Um, and there's been proposals for like woolly mammoths. We have a frozen, but you know that's that's you know years of ever. Right. It's still contra very controversial. But in terms of the biogeography of like where things are, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Right, so here we can understand the causes of some allopatic speciation events, right? So did these islands separate, did these islands pop up, it was a dispersal, that sort of thing. Good, what else?
It also explains wh wh why things are where they are, right? So why don't you know, so do polar bears eat penguins? Anyone know? No. Why? Right. Now, if I airlifted some bunch of polar bears to Antarctica, they'd probably be very happy for a while, right? But why aren't they in Antarctica? Well, it's because they cross, you know, they evolved the northern hemisphere and have to cross the tropics to get there. Right, so it sort of explains these large patterns of why we see, you know, things where they are. Why do we have these large penguin rookeries? We don't have the same thing on the Arctic. Right? Penguins don't go north of the equator. They get very close to the Galapagos, actually. Um, <coughs> but polar bears are only northern hemisphere, and things like that. So these co-evolved areas, you know, with we have the trees and the pollinators and the parasites and things like that, are sort of linked by living in the same area, vice versa. Now, phylogeography is even finer scale, and often tells us more about, you know, the speciation events, recent expansions. So, you know, we have North America half covered by ice, the ice goes away, what happens? Right? Does everyone move north evenly? Do things just at the front of the wave, right next to the glaciers, follow them up? Right? Were they in, when the glaciers were here, were they in multiple little refugia, or were they all in just one warm area? Okay, and these sort of questions we can get at with phylogeography. Okay. <coughs> so here's an example. Okay. Looking at these, basically it's a phylogeny, which you're sort of getting used to, sort of clumped. So here we have, you know, a whole bunch of individuals in this clump, a bunch of individuals in this clump, but then mapped in space onto a map, actual map. Okay. And so here we see a big gap between you know, eastern, like Floridian and, and related species, Mississippi species. Okay? And so you can ask, was there some sort of split between there? Is it just sort of what you expect by chance? Okay, because a lot of these can be generated just randomly. There's going to be some tree that evolves. Does it match, you know, the history or not? Okay? Here you can do the same sort of thing, a uh, network showing, you know, this, this is a tree where each step is one change apart. Okay. And you can see how this is arranged on, on the um, on the map on the map. Okay. And here's also an example of controversy in biology. Okay. Because one way this is analyzed is something called nested clade analysis. So what's a clade? Ancestor and descendants. Right, ancestor and all descendants, right? Nested clade is just clade, and then parent clade, and then parent clade, and parent clade, and it's a clade analysis. And the approach is very appealing because you make a network like this with just one gene, and then you give it to a table, and you look up in your table, you say, my network looks like this, and you look up, and it says, okay, you know, what have you found? You found a trick the gene flow in dispersal over some lots of dispersal over intermediate areas. I think, oh, wow, you know, it happened on Thursday. Um, so it gives you very, very detailed explanations for what's happened. Okay. The problem is it doesn't work very well. Okay. So lots of people use it because, you know, that we could say it works well and, you know, it gives you these nice explanations. Oh, it's gene flow. Oh, it's population splitting. Oh, it's this or that expansion. Okay. But, but then people actually went in and said, okay, if the true history were this, let me simulate it. Do you give me the same answer? And oftentimes the answer is no. Right? So it gives you an answer, doesn't give you any certainty, and often give you the wrong answer. Okay? So this is an example of how people argue over methods in science. Okay? So <coughs> example. So within a phylogeny, so you know, species splitting or population splitting, there's individual genes. Right? So I can make a phylogeny of all of us in this room based on our mitochondria. Right, all inherit from our mothers. At some point, we'll go back to coalesce to one individual. Right? I can do it based on a nuclear gene. So a gene that says maybe a Hox gene for eye expression. You know, make an eye here. And I can follow that gene back through history. Okay? Those won't completely agree. Right? At some point, I might have gotten my mitochondrial gene from my you know, great 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 grandmother, but my Hox gene for my eye from my great 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 grandfather over here who came from a different side of the family. And you, might more, you might be more closer to him than you are to my grandmother. Right? So the gene trees don't always agree. Does that make sense? Okay. 
See some ask questions if it doesn't. Yes, no? Basically, <clears throat> we would be more related to one ancestor by one gene if we were related to another one. Yeah, so let's, let's do a simulation. And this can be hard. I mean, this was only really, I mean, people have known about this for 10, 30, you know, decades. But people in like, my area are going to be under, like, think about this a lot only in the past 10 years. So, all right, let's say I have this population, and let's say we have just, let's do two different genes. Let's say we're haploid, right? And you're going to have one copy of each gene. Okay. I have two genes. And now, each of has just one parent. Oh, oh, three genes. Two parents. Um, uh, and I have one parent for my green gene, one parent for my red gene. That's my parent's mate, and then I throw half the genes. Um, and so this one might have, by chance, this parent for this gene, right? And this one might have this parent for this gene, this one might have this parent, 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 this one might have this parent. Okay. So first of all, what does this tell us? about making a gene tree of just the red genes. You can have more than one offspring? Right, you can have more than one offspring or you can have zero offspring. Right? And when you have more than one offspring in the population, this is called a coalescence event. Can you guess why? We have two things that coalesce that merge into one. Okay, so coalesces. So one interesting thing is that population size affects this, right? So if a previous generation has just two individuals in it, we're going to have a whole lot of coalescence events, right? Because to get from there to there, you had to, had to have many offspring. At some point, going back in the past, I'm going to have, you know, at some point, all go back to one ancestor. Okay. Is this the, you know, the first of the species to appear? Well, no. I just put that as a common ancestor is. So right now, all humans for mitochondria, we have some common ancestor, tens of thousands of years old. Okay. At some point in the future, assuming we still survive. That common ancestor will be, you know, someone alive today, right? And all humans will be descended on the maternal line from that one person. Okay, is that person special in some way? No, they just happen to be lucky and have, you know, we know they had at least one child, right? That's all we know, though. Um, <coughs> okay, so we can figure out if they're looking at the rate of these coalescence events, we can get information about things like population size, right? So they have a whole bunch of coalescence events. Up here tightly, as up in a small population like this. Right? And you know, we can we have to be more investigating more information on this. Okay. Um, and so we can do the same thing with the green ones. And they might often match, but not always. Right? So think about you, right? So you have two copies of every gene. If you have kids, you're going to pass on, you know, through eggs or sperm, one copy, right? Your copy of you got from your mom or from your dad. Well, it's typically 50-50. Cool thing is actually not always completely 50-50. We'll get to that later, maybe. Um, but usually it's 50-50. Okay. And so there's a chance that your mother's gene will be passed on, and your father's gene will be, won't be passed on, and your that took your offspring. Okay. And so. Um, when we have a speciation event, so any, any questions on that? A little fast, but a little good fat. Okay. When we have a speciation event, right? So you have this population going through going through time, 
and they have multiple copies of the genes. Well, it's possible that um, all the copies coalesce within this, for like these two species, coalesce in this species. Right? The most recent common ancestor of all the genes could be here. Okay? But it might not be. It might be the most recent common ancestor for some of the genes is down here. In this case, the gene tree for some genes disagrees with the species tree. Right? No? Okay. And this gives us information because if, again, if I had a small population size here, I'm going to have a lot of coalescence events, so I'm going to, probably going to have things match. If you have a huge population for a very short time, there's not much coalescence, and so we can have this discordance. Okay? And so what you can do with this um, simulation where they said, okay, we could have two possibilities for this particular group of species we're looking at. One is a fragmentation. So this one population, climate change happens, and I have multiple individual populations. Okay, all basically a big polytomy. The other possibility is I had three refugia. So climate's getting bad, but I can live here, or here, or here. Okay, and all you do is just simulate evolution under each of those scenarios. And then what you can do is pass it into you know, different methods and see how well they work. Okay. And so <coughs> here you can see you know, results for um, how often this nested clade analysis is accurate. Right? And 30% you know, accurate, 35% accurate, 0% you know, accurate. Okay. Depending on the model used, it's not accurate. And so this is how people can test methods in science. Right? So, because I mean, science is an inference-based process. Right? You get your data, you go back and find out what could have explained the data. Okay? And you can go get a new data to test it. And here they're showing that this particular method won't work well. Right? <coughs> um, so NCA did not identify the processes used. So it doesn't work, don't use it. Right? Like people who like NCA say, yes, it does. Um, but they haven't really done simulations to support it well enough, right? This is sort of how conflict happens in science. Okay. And here we see examples of, so here's a case of four grasshopper species, okay? And looking at four different genes, okay? And the genes show sort of the same history. If you sort of squint, you say, okay, I have a green group that's splitting off, and then I have an orange group and a blue group and a red group, but they're not always clades. Right, and so they can take the average of those in some way and figure out sort of the average history of the species. Okay? But it could be that you have gene flow going on, or it could be that you just have large population sizes and things not coalescing. Or it could be that you've gotten these trees wrong. Okay? And the one thing you can also do with these approaches is figuring out when splits happened. Right? So, and also if you look at the amount of time it takes for coalescence events, right? So here I have um, populations separated by the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean, okay? And presumably there's, they split at some point, and Florida became above the, the ocean, right? Ocean levels dropped, Florida goes up. Um, but you can see that the, the, when these populations split is different for different species. So why could that be? Okay, right, so it could have been when the event happened, and so some of them react quickly and immediately have lo loss of gene flow, others still have some gene flow, right? Um, because that's one possible explanation. What's another? Yeah, it could be, so it could be a fast mutation rate, right? So. Um, this is just raw divergence. So out of every 100 bases, what proportion are different, right? So if, if they're evolving faster because they have more adaptive mutations or because they do a worse job repairing their DNA or because they're subject to more mutations, um, they could have longer, uh, more, more changes. Good. 
What else? Would uh, reproduction rate affect this? Yeah, so that so generation time can affect things like how many how many changes you have. Right. So we talked about earlier about like trees versus herbs in terms of branch length. Exactly. So that sort of thing's happening here too. Good. What else? What else? It could be noise. So it could be that this one, you know, coalesced here, uh, like that, and the other one coalesced just happened to coalesce one generation back from one generation <coughs> back. Right? So at some point you're going to reach a common ancestor. But exactly when that happens, is influenced by population size and things like that and generation time. But it's also, you know, when you go from two to one, it's sort of a random process, too. And so their signal is also noise. So this, this difference could all be just due to noise, too. Okay? And that's why you need to think about how can I test for signal? How can I you know, figure out which explanation is true? Okay, so like this, we'll say, okay, well, there's multiple ex possible explanations. What, what's the next step? How do you figure out which it is? Okay? And if it's just noise, then if I look at a different gene, I should see a different result. If there's something signal, then if I look at, you know, if these are evolving faster, the next gene I look at should also show a deep branch here. So you can use more data to start supporting or refuting your hypotheses. Okay. <coughs> you can also use uh, phylogeographic methods to look at how things disperse. Okay, so here's a group of frogs, got two different species of frogs, and looking at sort of reconstructing where they originated. Okay, where did this group originate? Um, and what you can do is simulate possible moves, and then actually reconstruct the possible moves. We reconstruct the actual moves based on the tree. And what do you see here? The observed is far less complicated. Yeah. Right? So that's where they can hop all over the place, right? The observed, they take these little steps along these lines. What these lines are showing is potential habitat for them, right? So they didn't like, you know, these frogs didn't leap over the mountains go from place to place. They sort of, well, actually, these I think they're mountain frogs. But they hopped along where they could, where they could survive, right? Yeah. But what about the observed one next to the? Well, there's two bright stars, but one of them seems to hop like, over right there. Yeah. yeah. So again, this is this, this is just based on the reconstructed trees. So it could be that there are other nodes they've missed. It could be there's an error. Or it could be that it actually was a big dispersal. Yeah. And one thing we'll get to later is that with these reconstructions, there's a lot of uncertainty. So this point's here, but it might, you know, with about equal probability be over here, over here. Yeah. So it's good to think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and you're showing really good thinking and looking at, like, exceptions to this. So that's good. Other questions? Another thing you do with phylogeography is find out where invasive species are coming from. So what's an invasive species? So it's technically just a species that's been moved by humans, typically from one place to another, but we care about them because they have these ecological effects they often have, right? And of course, one thing you realize from biogeography, biogeography is species are always moving around, right? If there weren't sort of invasions, then Hawaii would have just, you know, crabs and other things derived from the ocean and no birds, right? Unless they re-evolved in Hawaii from something else, right? But they, they disperse there. But yeah, go ahead. Sorry, invasive species are just specifically humans that can move? Uh, no, they're sort of, no, I mean, that, that's, that's the most common mechanism, but they're like just newly arrived species at this point, yeah, yeah. Um, and we care about them because they can cause these ecological damages, right? So if instead of invasive species, I, ha I you know, transported a nuke, you know, and dropped a nuke somewhere, right? It would wipe out the area, right? A nuke part of Australia, boom, that part's gone, right? The rest of Australia is fine. 
right? I drop a rabbit in Australia, right? Well, it's cute, but it starts spreading and spreading and spreading and spreading and spreading and spreading because you know, it's biology. It's something that increases exponentially, okay? And if it has a, a negative impact on the environment, right? Like, and we, we define negative impacts as things like lowering diversity, right? Then um, it's very hard to eradicate, okay, often. And so we care about where these things come from, right? We think about if, you know, a certain shipping mechanism, so for example, ballast water. So ships, when they're traveling light, will often put water in the ship itself, the ship goes lower, right? Because it's really high, you know, think of the little rubber duck high on the, high on the water, it can capsize, right? So if you have more ballast, it's lower and more stable. <coughs> the problem people were finding was that this ballast water would be captured somewhere, brought somewhere, and then when the ship loads again, it gets heavier, so it dumps the ballast water. Well, it's basically a way of transporting large amounts of water across the globe. And so they're finding that various marine life is being transported around using ballast water. So now ships will often go through a procedure where they'll dump ballast water and get new ballast out, out at sea and get new ballast water before they go to a port. So that way they don't carry things from port to port, from coast to coast. Okay? And understanding what's causing these things, you need to look at where invasive species come from. So here's a species called the Argentine ants. Okay? And their native range is here in blue. And they're found all over the place here. Okay? And so the question is, are they continually being reintroduced from their host population? Or do we have it so that they're coming from you know, the one restriction here, and then these go over here, and then these spread, and that sort of thing. Okay? And so um, here's a phylogeny showing that you know, all these pieces from all around the world are actually, actually in a clade with a few Australian, Argentinian species, Argentinian individuals, right? Whereas ones from Brazil are more distantly related. So it suggests that the invasion came from the Australian one, uh, the um, Argentinian ones, not from the Brazilian ones. Okay, and probably did happen once. Okay. And one really cool thing about Argentinians is the native habitat, different colonies will fight. Okay. Um, you know, Wilson once said the biggest enemies of other of ants are other ants, right? And so we've seen the ants fighting. But these spreaders often will, have, often will form what's called a unicolon, unicolonial. So you can take them from Tennessee, drive them to California, drop them on a different nest. And they're like, oh, hello, sister, how are you? And because their workers are female. And they won't fight. Okay? Whereas in native habitat, they will. Okay? Which also means that the energy they, they expend into fighting each other now they can produce, now they can use them to making more workers and making more babies and spreading more. Okay. And so, and this gives a possible explanation for why they do that, because if you just have one population that's spreading, then it'd be that genetic, genetic diversity um, for them to recognize differentness. Okay. And so often recognize this differentness with host, host with, with nest odor, like what they smell like, um, but there could be genetic factors too. Um, it could be that there were multiple introductions, but the only one that took off was the one where they were too dumb to recognize, oh, you're not from the same nest. Okay? And maybe, maybe in you know, the native habitat, that would be bad because you know, the neighbor would come in and just kill them all. They'd go, oh, hi, ah, right? But here, you know, there's no one to compete with other, other, other species that recognize different species, so they can spread more easily. Okay? So there's no use of file geography. Right, any questions? Thank you all.